they just know that traditional solutions haven't worked for them. Here's why that space is so magical. Uh, most of the people I work with pull from a variety of disciplines to bring something new to the market that folks haven't seen before. Hello, today's guest is Jeffrey Van Dyke. Jeffrey is on a mission to help visionaries, trailblazers, and change makers unleash their paradigm shifting work upon the world. As the founder of The Courageous Messenger, his special genius translates forward thinking, visionary work into packaging, positioning, and messaging in a way that resonates deeply with the people who are calling for it most. He draws upon an innate intuition, deep empathy, and seasoned marketing acumen. Jeffrey has a proven track record of helping leaders build thriving businesses from their life's truest calling that have a significant and lasting global impact. You can find out more at thecourageousmessenger.com. I'm delighted to welcome today's free thinker, Jeffrey Van Dyke. Jeffrey is also a very close friend of mine. Hello, Jeffrey. Hey there. Good to be here, Marcus. I'm, I'm very glad you're here. So we first met about 12 years ago when I did a year-long coaching program with you. It was, it was a real game changer for me in terms of an opening up to the world of what it meant to do business coaching, specific business coaching, how to market it, how to work with joint venture partners, how to, to create this whole thing. But it was also the intuitive aspect of the whole program. And there was the morning on one of the retreats in Ohio, when I said to you in between sessions, hey, would you go, like to go for a walk? And do you want to change conversation, change context? And do you want to be friends? Right. <laughs> yes, it was a very formal request. <laughs> I haven't done that before. But here we are 10 years, uh, 10 years later. And I think I've been, uh, there's no one in, the, in LA that I've been to more theater productions with you. We've gone to a lot of shows and so here's to many more. That's that's, that's um, right. Yep. So, so Jeffrey, how would you describe what you're currently doing within the world of marketing, within the world of business? The majority of people I'm serving these days are folks that have a high degree of mastery. They've been doing what they do for some time. They're usually pretty well regarded in their industry. And there's something next calling to them. So most of my work these days is helping them understand where they're meant to be going next, what the next iteration of their business, this next calling usually is about them being a bigger voice in their industry, bringing a new consciousness to their industry, a new understanding or idea of what their industry actually can be, um, and packaging a new solution in their business. Uh, you know, and, and the challenges with that are when it's this kind of intuitive sense of this next thing you're meant to do, really understanding what it is, who needs it, how to frame it and position it in the market mm. so people adopt it uh, and share it. Uh, that's, you know, that's part of the challenge. And if it's really forward thinking, a lot of the self-doubt stuff tends to creep in of, gosh, I know I'm good at this, but will I be good at that? I know people want this thing that I'm used to selling, but are they going to want that? Uh, so a lot of it is, you know, ends up being in the world of messaging, packaging, positioning, uh, but primarily for people who who are really bring, bringing something new and fresh to their market. Thank you. It's it's interesting to hear, and also I think hearing the evolution of it and. I also want to do as a second part of an introduction, just because people who are listening in who may not have, have um, learned about your work before, within the world of coaching, there can be occasionally some fluffiness, shall we say, or like, like it's, um, I'm not sure the, the most politically correct way of saying it, but you are... <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you, when, it, when I worked at Microsoft and commuted with my uh, uh, tech support guys, they called them fluffy bunnies. Fluffy uh, bunnies, right? So you are fluffy bunnies. You are hands down the most successful coach I know in real life. Like in terms of, it's a big. You're running a big operation. It is a big business with a great turnover, and a lot is happening. And you've trained a lot of coaches. And one thing I've often shared with people in recent years, because it seemed more relevant to them, is telling them about the wound-based marketing. If I may, can I just sort of sum it up as I understand it? I'm interested to know if this this is still in your within your wheelhouse, the idea that something that happened to you when you were younger, an event didn't happen to you, it happened for you. 
and it then became part of your story and you, you were able to use it. So for example, when I did my own recollection of this, I went back to, right, I was 15 or, and I felt excluded by the rest of my class and didn't have any friends and that kind of whole teenage thing and being called weird and being called strange. And then fast forward 25 years, realizing, oh yeah, I am weird. Like I've got a weirdness and a strangeness, but that, that was, that's the whole point. <laughs> like, like that's, the free brand like it wasn't intended to be when i try not to be that it, it comes out whether it's plays books whatever the shtick happens to be and so the wound-based marketing yeah. within within um within your world being the, the london bp outs okay so the wound-based marketing within your world being something where you can go into what was your pain what did you learn how is that part of your story and then how can you use that to serve others does that sound fair to market yeah. your marketing um, that's one aspect of it. That's definitely a body of work I, you know, developed. Um, I'll share just a few more nuances about it. A lot of my copy that I help people create, a lot of the positioning messaging is very empathy based. It's telling an audience, I know you, I see you, maybe on some level I've been you. Um, and I know how to get you from where you are to some new place you really desire to be. Uh, most of the people I serve, my favorite audience to target with folks, especially folks that have mastery and do a deeper dive than most people in their industry, mm -hmm. is to target audiences that are the end of their rope. Meaning they've tried all the conventional ways to get out of their pain or problem and are still stuck. I love those audiences. They tend to be highly skeptical. Another way to say it is very discerning. They can spot BS a mile away because they've already bought and been burned by a lot of BS. Uh, but they're still hungry. They still have their pain. They still have their yearning. They still have their desire. They just know that traditional solutions haven't worked for them. Here's why that space is so magical. When they know the traditional stuff isn't going to work for them, they're willing to go off-roading, right? They're willing to go try different things, to uh, explore solutions that are not conventional. And most of the clients I work with have unconventional <laughs> solutions. Right. Uh, most of the people I work with pull from a variety of disciplines to bring something new to the market that folks haven't seen before. Now, the empathy thing in relationship to wounds is this. Uh, we all have wounds. We all have struggles and pains that we've experienced in life. And part of those struggles and pains, we develop an identity. Uh, we all have wounds in our identity. These I am statements. I'm worthless. I'm unlovable. Uh, I'm stupid. I'm whatever the thing is. Mm. And what I find is that the clients we tend to resonate with most, especially as service providers, are people that share the patterns that come from those wounds, right? So for example, if you have a I'm stupid wound, the pattern is often not asking for help and hiding out, mm. uh, right? And the challenges that show up in business for those folks, if they're in business, is there are certain areas that, you know, there's any, any number of things in business that, hey, I'm good at this, but I'm not good at those things. And if I have a stupid wound and I'm not used to asking for help, guess what? The things I'm not good at are going to drown me. And that's where I'm going to struggle. So if I have a client who has this, this is a client I'm talking about who had a stupid wound, right? She worked with uh, brick and mortar businesses. And when we discovered this is the wound pattern, uh, you know, she was like, you know, I'm not going to walk around saying to people, I, I work with people who feel like they're stupid. Sure. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, no, obviously not. Right. What you're going to do is your market to the symptom or pattern of that challenge. And for her, the client she targeted had some area of their business, whether it was their invoicing or bookkeeping, whether it was, uh, uh, you know, client retention, whether it was talent retention, some area of their business where they just didn't have great skill. And because this old tape, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I don't want people to know, plays in their brain, they wouldn't reach out for help and it would bury them. 
that's, that's uh, really interesting. that created right and and then they would work their tail off because they were so buried so what we packaged for her was a program called the 80 hour work week cure um because they were all working their tails off because they were buried by some area of their business they just weren't skilled at thank you so, so that's just one can... example of how so yeah, can I ask, ask, ask a question does this approach apply to a service provider, a small business owner, someone outside of the, the coaching realm? Like this, this aspect of mar marketing, is there a way of applying it? Yes, uh, 100%. Um, and we'll get into kind of where the work has evolved since, it, oh, yeah, since, since this, but um, all right, I've got an architect as a client, uh, and part of her background is, you know, having a family system where there was a lot of, uh, coldness where people weren't connected or together. Right. And in her, and so she always yearned for connection. Mm. She always yearned for togetherness tried to get that to happen with a family system where that wasn't on offer. Um, as an architect, she takes a very team oriented approach to her work. And she knows that her best clients want that as well. They're hungry for that kind of togetherness to create a vision and a dream for their home. Right? So it doesn't show up usually as talking about the wound. Uh, it wouldn't work in business. It doesn't work in marketing. No. So we don't talk about it in direct, directly. We look at how some of these patterns show up in the pains and in the desires of an ideal market and speak to that. Because Brilliant. when it comes from our own experience, right? I know this place of yearning for connection deeply. I have hungered for it for you know years and years and years. That sense of, I know you, I see you, I get you, I understand you, that just goes off the charts. So when I speak about empathy and marketing, that's what I'm talking about. So, and I, we, yes, we want to get back to the creative messenger. So on this, this is very interesting because actually I don't remember us talking about this particular thing, which is, I guess, why we're, why we're here. So how would that apply if we were to, I don't know, like, let's say, like a, a, a drive-by take on it? Let's say if we take what I'd said before, okay, my own story, including, and I'll be careful not to be too vulnerable and open because I am English and we're not meant to show emotions, but the, yeah. um, <laughs> like this, the, sk the skill I got through 15, uh, you know, let's say age 15 of the, the story being, I haven't got any friends, I haven't got enough friends. And then the skill I learned was, I'm going to make as many friends as I possibly can. And, you know, just go out and build community and build relentlessly build community, which I've done in, in different areas. So now for, let's say I'm working with small businesses, providing their marketing services and sort of out of house marketing, the websites, the promotional videos, the digital ads and helping them with their strategy. Now I'm not going to speak to that vulnerability, but what might, how might that show up in practice? Well, let's, let's look at this first so every business owner knows that there is you know the strategic part of business but there's also you know what's often referred to as the inner game of business mindset work etc mm -hmm. uh, because as leaders there are certain things we're you know gifted at and certain things we're not there are certain places where we thrive and certain places where we don't and all of us have have um ruts we fall into Right. When I feel we'll, we'll get to you back to you in just a minute. When I feel like I am often when I'm in transition in my own business, right. And I've let go of maybe an offer or a way of doing things or an old audience or something like that. And I know I'm transitioning to something new, but the new thing isn't super clear yet. Right. It hasn't totally locked in. One of my old tapes that will play is uh, people don't want what I've got, right? And uh, it's an old tape and it's been with me a long time. Uh, I grew up feeling kind of unwanted. That's the wound. 
So how it shows up in my business as a leader is this old tape, ah, people don't want what I've got. Now, I've been doing this work in different iterations for almost 20 years at this point, right? I've made literally millions of dollars serving hundreds of thousands of people over almost 20 years. So logically, the tape doesn't make any sense. Right. And yet, when it starts playing, if I don't watch it, it can take me out. And every leader I've ever worked with has tapes that can take them out. Your job as a coach is to know what those tapes are and how they show up in the arena of their business you serve them. So if you're providing digital marketing services, you have to know how those show up in their relationship to marketing in general and digital marketing. Do they hide out? Do they, because like, uh, oh, oh, I always felt like I didn't have any friends or people don't want me, right? So do they hide out? Do they not show up consistently to what really needs to be produced to be online, to show up in social, to build an online following? One of the things I notice for the people I serve who have a belonging wound, because that's my wound, right? That's the shared, mm -hmm. I call it wound bonding. Mm -hmm is their messaging is usually ineffective and here's why they're too damn friendly in their messaging in their marketing and their positioning but particularly in the words they use they are not using a sharp sword of truth in their marketing the reason is they try to be nice to be liked to fit in as a proxy for belonging and that's how it shows up in their marketing. So how do you so shift a lot them? of what I've got to do? Yeah, <laughs> I work relentlessly to get my clients to say what they are actually here to say. So often the words they're using are generic. They're overused language that anybody in their marketing can in their market could use. I look at their website and I go, hey, could this be anyone else's website? And nine times out of 10, the answer is, oh, it could be most people's website. It is not tailored to them because they are not saying exactly what they're here to say. Hmm. So a lot of my work is being absolutely relentless about what their work really is, who they're actually here to serve, what stake in the ground they are here to put for their people, the message they are absolutely here to bring, such that their messaging stands out in a sea of sameness. It's amazing. And actually, you know, it's a, it's a long time. Although I see you whenever I'm in the States and we spend quite a bit of time together, it's a long time since we've been talking in this particular mode, the pre-friendship mode, the, uh, you know, like, like in that fresh mode. But it's like, it just kind of hit me. Um, you described a situation that I've seen, I've been showing, been showing up a lot recently. I mean, now's not the time to go into I mean, I very much want to have that conversation. But you just described a potential client profile that's been showing up over and over and over. Well, tell, tell me what it is. Okay. So people who are, they want their businesses to grow. There is fear. And as a result, they know what they have to do and they're not doing it. And so partly yeah, what's the fear fear of rejection fear of not being liked fear of fear of being left alone fear of it's not enough and and i'll present this is partly why i'm doing this whole exercise now with the free thinking podcast with the free thinker and everything else saying okay yeah i can see myself where i've been doing that i'm going to go fill out i've got 14 so um i've got 14 social media accounts right now I'm going to go, that's just the visual. We're going to go on another 10 audio platforms. I'm going to show this is what it can look like. But I'm seeing people, even when I'm saying to them, look, we'll put the free thinking team on this. All you need to do is show up. We'll help you draw out your messaging. You haven't got to do anything. It's not, you know, it's going to, it's well within your budget, the whole thing. But yet there's still, uh, there's, there's still some resistance to it. Even someone the other day where I basically, I figured out, his whole coaching was his whole marketing coaching package I was doing with him was completely sponsored. He was not going to have to pay a penny. And he, he still pulled out after like 
four sessions or something. It was just, okay. So this is what yeah. I'm seeing showing up. So the, the distinction, if we go back to the wound piece, mm. is there are some people who are still in a place where they're really committed to staying hidden, to staying in the wound, whatever the wound is, to staying mm. in the pattern. They're not ready to exit the pattern yet. Those aren't viable clients, right? The viable clients are the people who want to ex exit the pattern and don't know how. Now, depending on your interest and skill, and I'm saying you both personally and the plural you, sure. there's two aspects to getting results for clients. I call them the transactional benefit and the transformational benefit. Unless the only thing that's preventing your client from getting success is skill building, right? Skill building is all external. I need to learn something. I need skill. to learn skills and They've acquire skill. skills that I do not have, right? But most problems are not skill-based, at least not alone, right? They're also a matter of who am I that's showing up? And how is that helping to create the very problem I say I want to solve, right? So there's someone they need to become en route to the solution that you sell in addition to doing the activities they need to do in order to have the solution you sell. The transaction are the activities, it's external. The transformation is internal. It's how they need to grow as a leader to both get and sustain the results. Sometimes I see people who can help a client get a result, but the moment they leave the building, the consultant or whomever leaves the building, the client reverts back to last known good configuration, right? Mm -hmm. And so either they can't get and sustain, you know, either they can't get the result or they can't get and sustain the result because they have not become the person who can have that kind of result, right? Mm -hmm. So if your people share a pattern with you of deep down the old voices, I'm not liked, I'm not welcomed. Uh, Guess what? If you go, oh, great, we're going to broadcast you on 20 different social media platforms and plaster your message and voice <laughs> all over the world, it's a recipe for amplified rejection. Right? Hey, if I just market in my own little pocket where I already know people like me, I'll be fine. But if I step outside of that pocket, now I've got to risk something, and that's scary. And most people are not super conscious that this is actually what's going on inside. They just kind of vaguely feel some resistance to it and don't know why and just kind of, you know, well, let me just exit the building uh, through the back door over here, right? So if you know that that's a pattern that shows up for your people, there's two things I would say. One, get clearer about the client profile in terms of, where are they at in relationship to that pattern? Do they want to stay stuck in that pattern? Are they committed to staying stuck in that pattern? Not yet willing to look at that pattern? Uh, unwilling for a consultant like you to say, hey, let's look underneath the hood while we also do these strategic activities so that we're really successful. Hmm. Your best clients would be like, oh yeah, there's something there. Thank you. That would be really helpful. Clients that aren't ready for that would be like, uh, I, what hood are you talking about? I don't want to look under a hood. I don't have anything under any hoods. What are you talking about? Mm. Right. Uh, I'm perfectly fine. Just execute on the strategy. Thank you very much. So it's tailoring um, is tailoring the so, messaging to the known problem or to those, those people, whatever that looks like, like it might be. It's to the known problem. Absolutely. The known problem is, Hey, I need, I need a bigger audience. I need to grow my audience. I need a bigger market share. I need more visibility in social, et cetera. That's the known problem. Yes, I need to do this. I'm not maybe either very skilled at it or I don't have the bandwidth to do it. Okay, great. That alone is a commodity. You sell it. Thousands of other people sell it. Exactly. Right. The way you exit the world of commodity is by tailoring it to the people that you know most intimately because on some level you've been them. Right. To say, hey, do you know that it's time to have a bigger reach, to be more visible, to 
uh, show up more consistently on social? Do you know that if you did, uh, your business would grow exponentially? And do you know that logically that's what you want, but somewhere inside you seem to be dragging your feet? Uh, you don't exactly know why, uh, but every time you try to engage with it, you kind of stop yourself somewhere, even when you've hired consultants to help you, right? If that's you, uh, chances are you do have a message. You do have people that are hungry for what you've got. However, there might be some old voices inside that say people don't want to hear from you. Uh, so, you know, part of the way I work and I structure my work is that we get more deeply into who you need to be to show up as a leader so that you're willing to show up socially uh, and that you're willing to show up in a much bigger way in your marketing. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, yeah. also, you know, taking care of all the nuts and bolts so that, you know, whether it's a matter of time or skill, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, getting the campaign actually done and launched. Yes, that's, it, it's very powerful. And thank you. So that's phenomenal. How does that now translate into the latest iteration of your work with the courageous messenger? If you think about the hero's journey, there's two halves to it. So just to bring people the up speed, if, if someone's is... not aware of the, uh, are we going to over uh, just give an iteration of the, the hero's journey? Just many people may not be aware of it at this point. So, uh, they're aware of it. They just might not know the phrase. Okay. So, right. um, this is just Joseph, Joseph Campbell coined it, but we see the hero's journey in almost every movie we've ever watched books we've read, uh, and the lives we've lived. Basically it's this, there is a person going along do, 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 in their daily life. And then they get what's called a call to adventure. Something interrupts life as they know it. And they have to leave life as they know it and go on this adventure. Um, so in real life, you know, you're going along and your spouse serves you divorce papers uh, or your, you know, the stock, stock market crashes or uh, or you get this huge balloon of new clients and money. But now you're buried with all the work and understaffed and uh, maybe you have a health crisis that happens because of it. Hmm. Right. Oh, here's a great example. I have a client whose uh, sons went skiing and got in a car accident and one died. And it sent him on this deep spiritual quest to mm. find meaning. Yeah. Right. So that's the first half. Uh, we get called to the adventure uh, because there's something about life that's been disrupted and there's something more we must discover. There's all these different steps technically when you learn about it, but just to recap a little bit of it, usually we resist the call. We don't want the change. We don't want to upset our life. And at some point we relinquish and go on the quest. Uh, we experience trials and tribulations. We get mentors and helpers. And then there is this center moment uh, halfway through where we have to slay a dragon. We have to face the thing we don't want to face. Uh, and psychologically, that's the core wound. Psychologically, we have to encounter these old messages directly and uh, go, am I really going to live by them anymore? Is that really the truth of who I am? Uh, for years, you know, I grew up as a gay kid in the Midwest in a super conservative uh, uh, household you know, religiously. Uh, and so I always felt like I was damned and didn't belong. Hmm. Um, and it wasn't until my mid forties, early forties, where I like, that was the, that, that moment for me where I had to look at it face, face on and feel the pain of saying, I don't belong on this planet. I don't belong in this world. No one, nobody wants me. Right. And, and really look at it dead in the eyes. Mm. And in doing so, the power of it drains out of the wound. You see it for what it is, which is a story. Mm. 
It's just a story. Powerful one, and yet a story. Everything is a story. And so then we we get to dream up a better story, right? Uh, at this point in my life, that sense of I don't belong, it just isn't here. I do belong. Is there still residuals of that that can crop up at times? Sure. But even then, I can see it for what it is. Oh, there's the old story. It doesn't capture me. I don't become one with that story. And the process, so that's the first the, the process to get there is look the dragon in the eye, fight it, slay it. See that story, allow that. Yes, which is it. actually, you know, Brene Brown, to paraphrase Brene Brown, uh, until you own your story, your story owns you. Hmm. So it's this matter of taking ownership of that story. Once you have ownership, there is this authority, this sovereignty, this power uh, that gets into your bones, mm. right? I don't ask permission anymore. I'm not looking for you to like me in the way I once was. I am, I am here to lead and leadership is not about being liked. No. Right? And I don't shy away from that anymore. That's interesting. Uh, so the second half of the... What's that? That's, it's, it's interesting to hear. It's very interesting to hear when we are, we're trained to be liked. And, you know, the first part of this journey as, as a coach, as a mentor, as a thought leader, blah, 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 whatever you want to name it, um, I didn't know this consciously, but I built a following because I didn't feel like I belonged. <laughs> Right. You know, I built people that would like me and go, oh, Jeffrey, you're so cool. And I really want to be around you and learn from you and da, da, da. The shadow side of that, I needed to be needed. And I tended to attract people that were more needy. Uh, the shift has been, I I have no time for that at this point. Great. <laughs> right. I work with highly capable people. Uh, that's not the story at this point. The story is we've got work to do. Let's go. Mm. The second half of the journey. So in the hero's journey, when you slay the dragon, you get an elixir or another way to say it. If you go to the depths of the, the, the mine, you, you get jewel, you learn something so deep and intrinsic, so valuable they have this amazing wisdom, this amazing gift to bring back to the tribe. So the second half of the journey is the return journey home. Now, on that journey, people often hesitate because like, oh, life's so good now. I like it. Uh, I have this amazing elixir, this amazing jewel in my heart. I don't really want to face the real world. It's so nice in this magical world. Uh, but no, the point of the hero's journey the whole point of it is not to slay the dragon. The point of it is to bring that elixir back to the tribe, to bring it back home and to share what you've learned with the world. Uh, so I would say how my work has shifted in the first many years working around wounds and market. Mm. A lot of it was helping people understand, oh, I've been this kind of person and now I will serve that kind of person. Uh, this point in my career, I'm much more interested in working with people who are like, I have something. I know I've got something. It's powerful. I see the impact of it. Uh, and now I am I am on this quest to bring this elixir back to the world. And from a business perspective, a lot of that work is uh, the work of positioning and packaging and then messaging. It is, uh, but, but but what I'm doing there is going, what's the, what's the thing that you've got that nobody else has got? What are you seeing that nobody else is seeing? How does that provide exponential value in your market in a way that nobody else is bringing? Mm. How do we position that in the market so that you stand as a category of one, right? Uh, it's about moving from being, uh, trying to be a market leader to being a market creator, mm. right? To say, 
of the because when you've got that elixir, it's not the standard thing. Not everybody is walking around with the elixir. Not everybody is willing to even go on the hero's journey, let alone come back with the elixir. Right. So those that have that, they see something and know something that is so valuable for people in their market, but their market isn't familiar with what they're bringing, right? So for example, I've got a real estate developer uh, who came to me and he's like, I keep getting this message. I meant to develop real estate that helps people self-actualize. It's, it, I, now, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Some it's, area, area. Say, it's, it's, sorry, like, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. Like I, a uh, regular free thinking client is a, uh, building contractor in LA and we're working, working in the real estate realm, but it, it's, um, I'm, I'm very intrigued. I'm even more intrigued to hear what comes next because one does not, again, the way the, 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 sort of the Jeffrey Van Dyke brand, it doesn't, you don't think, oh yeah, great. This is going to be a real estate developer. Like how, how on earth this is going to play itself out. So <laughs> I haven't necessarily <laughs> added anything by that interjection, interjection, but it's very, it's very interesting. Good. My, my aim with the, my aim with the podcast is people can listen to it and say, okay, how can we learn from what you're saying? So yes, please continue. Yeah. So the elixir for this guy, he left home at age 16, had a volatile household. Uh, there's a deep yearning for home that he never felt. Right. Then he found home. Um, and funny enough, went into real estate development, which is not in his family lineage, uh, became very, very successful. He was on the forefront of the co-housing movement. Um, so when he came to me and he said, you know, I get this sense, I'm meant to innovate in the market and create a form of real estate that helps people self-actualize. That's kind of the language he had when he started. And he knew like, this is still super in the sense of something world. And I have no idea how it will translate into business, mm. uh, which is why we started working together. How it's translated is this. Uh, the word we landed on that really was pivotal was deceleration. Uh, that everyone moves so fast right? Our focus is pulled every which way. And uh, most of us get home depleted and exhausted and turn on Netflix and call it a day. Mm. And that's, that's life as we know it. But what if real estate, your apartment, the place you live, which is arguably one of the places you spend the most time in your life, was structurally designed to help you come home to yourself, right? So that's translated into a intellectual property and consulting company that we built, he built uh, side by side with his real estate development company that is, you know, brought in neuroscientists, color theorists, lighting technologists, interior designers, people who are experts in biophilia, all of these different disciplines who know a thing or two mm. about how to use the built environment, the very environment we live in, to help people drop in, to decelerate and come home to themselves. Now, this is technology that's just built into how the building is structured, right? You don't even have to do anything but live there to be aided in coming home to yourself. At some point down the road, there may be additional programming, uh, you know, whether it's programming around personal development or success building or what have you. Um, the whole idea of this is, hey, look, real estate can actually play a much more purposeful role in society because society is in dire straits. Most, I, most people I think would, acknowledge and recognize mm. and and see uh and we need more people who are able to contribute to their best right uh but we're so depleted and so exhausted that we can't do that so real estate can play a role in helping people decelerate come home to themselves so they can be their best so they can give their best
Beautiful. Now, that's on the mission side of it. Mm. It's not the marketing at right. first. From a marketing standpoint, right? We That's like, oh, that's all truistic and that's lovely and that's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Moving on, right? Because no, he's mostly, selling yeah. this intellectual this approach to other developers. So I'll just say this last thing and then we can wrap up. From a business perspective, from a positioning perspective, developers have two basic problems they're always trying to solve. One, they want to differentiate their apartment buildings, right? This is, this is more luxurious or in a better neighborhood or what have you. They want to differentiate. And then once they get people to rent in their apartments, they want uh, people to stay, right? They want retention, right. differentiation and retention. So we're still solving those problems. Now, guess what? People want to live in and stay in places that feel good. Mm. If you think about like going to a bar with friends, what happens when you go into a bar that's kind of dingy or we like, oh, it's dead in here and, and we leave. And we go into a, a, a restaurant or a, or a bar or something like that. And then it feels so good. I like, I love the energy in here. It's so great. We want to stay. Well, the same thing is true in apartment living. So we're solving the same problem but doing it in a very different way by helping people feel really good and go, oh, there's no other building that feels like this. Um, so even if it's a premium to live here, this is where I want to live, right? So this, all this work around bringing the elixir back home, yes, it's true. The elixir is up-leveling what's possible in society by creating people who are more capable of giving back via the buildings they live in. That's the mission. The marketing is still addressing market needs. And that's the thing we always have to balance when we're really doing mission-driven work in the marketplace. I, I think it's phenomenal and it, it's fascinating and personally really seeing the evolution of the work and, and seeing how this is generating and, and how it's growing and, and how it continues to grow. And thank you personally for the inspiration, professionally for that framework and, and the guidance and giving your time here. Thank you very much, Jack. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been fun, Marcus. Thank Good you. to see you. Thank you for watching or listening in. Please make sure you follow our YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. And if you'd like email updates about future episodes, please sign up at freedthinking.com. I'm Marcus Freed. Keep thinking freely and stay creative. Goodbye for now. Oh,